And so you can see then how that they would be very much distressed and, and it would be a, something that would cause them a great deal of anxiety. These words that Jesus was speaking to them, these were perhaps the last things that they would ever want to hear from Jesus. Very distressing news. But Jesus recognizing that, in the midst of all that distressing news, told them something that would give them hope. He told them something that would allow them uh, to have a reason to press on and to continue to do the work that they had already started doing at Jesus' behest, and that is to go and preach to the various cities and preach the gospel of the kingdom. You know, the passage of scripture that Dale read for us just now does the exact same thing for us. It gives us hope. It gives us a reason for being faithful to our Lord. It gives us a reason to be diligent, working in what we know to be the kingdom that Jesus Christ claimed and, and promised that he, would, that he would build, and that is the church, the body of Christ, which we are part of. How distressing it is to recognize that we have to deal with life here upon this earth. It's hard. It's tough, isn't it? But Jesus, as he told his apostles that evening up in the upper room, how that he had good news for them. That same is good news for you and me today. It gives us hope, and it gives us a reason to press on. I want us to consider how that Jesus told his apostles, I go to prepare a place for you. I asked Alec if he would lead the song that we just sang, An Empty Mansion. He texted me back. He said, absolutely, it's one of my favorites, so I was glad to hear that. It's a beautiful song, isn't it? It's a song wherein we sing about these mansions that Jesus says that he has gone to prepare for those who are his followers, his disciples. Do you have any idea how many songs we have in this blue song book that are about heaven? 66. 66 songs in our hymnal that we use now about heaven. The beauties of heaven, the glories of heaven. In other words, we recognize heaven's pretty important to us. Heaven is something that we are eagerly in anticipation of. And perhaps the reason why is because of what Jesus told his apostles on this evening in that upper room, I go to prepare a place for you. Let me ask you a question. What is your idea of a mansion? Uh, in the American Standard Version, it says dwelling places. But the King James Version says mansions, and I kind of prefer that because of that kind of lends itself to more of the glories of heaven. How wonderful and glorious it will be. But what is your idea of a heaven? Several years ago, before I moved here to Indiana, I went on a house walk in Austin, Texas. And every one of the houses that we were able to walk through and look at and talk to the builder and the, and the architect who designed them, every one of those houses cost in excess to, of $1 million, from $1 million to $5 million. I don't know if you would necessarily call them a mansion, but they were pretty special houses, something that the vast majority of people will never be able to enjoy in their life. But what, is, what, would, what do you picture in your mind when you say mansion? Would that do? If you walked through the front door and this is what you saw, would you think that you were in a mansion? I think probably so. This is actually more than a mansion. It was one of Saddam Hussein's palaces. Obviously, the man didn't have to rough it uh, because, as I understand it, he had maybe about seven such palaces that he lived in. But this clearly is a mansion. And yet, as we think about heaven, this is nothing compared to what Jesus promised on that day. How that he is going to prepare a place for us. The King James Version calls it a mansion. He's going to prepare a place where we can come and we can be with he and the Father and the Holy Spirit and all the redeemed of all 
the ages. We sometimes sing another song of heaven about heaven called Won't It Be Wonderful There? And I think that probably all of us, at least at some point in our lives, have wondered what would it be like to live in a place like this? That if we could call this home, this was our home that we got to come home to. I don't know, uh, in my present condition, that looks like a lot of stairs to me. But, it, but it's still a mansion. It's still a mansion. And we sing about heaven, about won't it be wonderful there? Well, as we will see as we go through the lesson this evening, this has nothing to compare to what Jesus has gone to prepare for us. Think about it for just a moment. I was talking with Sister Bobby and Karen and, and uh, Julia this morning. We were talking a little bit about the various articles from the, uh, from the Bible that uh, men have claimed to have found. Uh, men have claimed to have found at least parts of the ark on the mountains of Ararat. There are people who claim that, uh, that uh, there was a, a radio station down in Mexico just across the border from Texas all the time when I was a kid growing up that was claiming that they had found the actual cross that Jesus uh, had been crucified on and for $5 or whatever it was, uh, they would send you a piece of it. And they did that for years and years and years and years. And if they had truly found the cross that Jesus had been crucified on, as many pieces of that thing that they surely sold, that cross must have been about a mile high as best I can tell. You know, but you know what? I think that God purposely made sure that none of those artifacts from the Bible days, both in the Old Testament and the New Days, uh, the New Testament, I believe that God has taken care of those things, that He has destroyed those things, that they will never be found because men have a tendency to make them objects of worship, don't they? Why, back in the days of Moses when the serpents were biting the people because of their disobedience and God told Moses, I want you to make a brazen serpent, put it on a pole so that people could look at it and if they would look at it as a matter of their faith, then they would be healed and they wouldn't die. Well, you know what? They made that an object of worship. It became known as Nehushtan and they worshiped it. And if indeed uh, we were talking about the Shroud of Turin this morning, how that uh, the, the, when they found that thing, and there was a lot to do with this shroud of Turin and, and the burial cloth of Jesus. And of course, we know that that can't possibly be what it was because it had the entire outline of a person, long hair and all, you know, and everything. Except I was telling Bobby, how could that possibly be the Shroud of Turin when you read the scriptures and when you see what the scriptures actually say, Jesus had a separate cloth around his head. He wouldn't have, his face would not have been on this shroud that they claimed to be the burial cloth of Jesus because that cloth only went up to his shoulders. He had a different cloth around his face and head. But that's the way men are. But just think about this for just a moment. Just allow your, your mind to, to wander a little bit here. What would it be back if you actually were in possession? Jesus was a carpenter, right? He was the son of a carpenter. What if you actually had a chair that Jesus had made? How special that would be to you. How incredibly special that would be to you. As a matter of fact, I think that if we were honest with ourselves, we would probably say and admit that we'd have a hard time not placing a lot more emphasis on that chair than what we should. Yes, if it was indeed a chair that Jesus had made, it'd make it very, very special. But how unhappy would Jesus be if we placed too much emphasis, too much glory on a physical object than he himself? But more so, Jesus promised his apostles and he promises you and me that he has gone to prepare a place for us. Now, he told his apostles there in the upper room, do not let your heart be troubled. And he says, as a matter of fact, let me tell you why your heart shouldn't be troubled. And that's because I go to prepare a place for you. The fact of the matter is that this world is filled with all kinds of trouble, isn't it? This world is filled with all kinds of difficulties. It's filled with all kinds of sorrows. 
It's, it's, deal, it's filled with temptation and sin. And as beautiful as the world is, can you imagine what it would have been like before the fall of man, the beauties of God's creation? We're, we're living in a broken world, and it's still a very beautiful, beautiful world that we have to enjoy. But it's a world that is filled with trouble. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians. He said, in far more labors, he was telling them, now listen, I want to tell you something about, about the difficulties of this life and, 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 uh, and how, we can, how we can handle the difficulties of this life. He said, in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death, five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes, Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers of rivers, dangers of robbers, dangers of my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers in the sea, dangers from false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure of me on me of concern for all the churches. I, I you know, I, I look at that and I think to myself, I haven't had to deal with anything like what the Apostle Paul had to deal with. Can you imagine being beaten with rods, receiving five times from the Jews 39 lashes? and being stoned and left for dead. And if that wasn't bad enough, then there's all those other things. But the thing that is so impressive about this is what Paul had written in this second epistle to the brethren at Corinth just a little bit earlier than he said this. Just a little bit early, earlier he says, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Uh, that's the reason why I have said many times, I, I just can't identify with Paul. I, I really can't. I mean, here is a man that was beaten and received 39 lashes. He was stoned and left for dead. He, he had all those other things done to him, and he still was able to talk and to call those things momentary light affliction how in the world could he do that what kind of faith does it take to where you could endure all of these things and think that's just light stuff that really isn't all that much well look what he wrote to the church at Rome for I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us so as Paul thought about, and remember, Paul was the one that was given the privilege of going into paradise, seeing the realm of God. And because he saw the glories of heaven, things that he said are not even permissible for men to speak of, he, he saw the glories of heaven. And having experienced all of those kinds of things, he said, you know what? Being beaten, being stoned and left for dead, all of these things here, they're not worthy of even being mentioned in the same breath with the glory of heaven. What a wonderful, wonderful place that is that Jesus says, I have gone to prepare a place for you. Another way of saying what Jesus did say there was, I'm going to prepare a home for you. 1946, the song Home Sweet Home introduced to us the phrase, mid pleasures and palaces through though we may roam, be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. There was a song written and sung back in the 60s, I believe it is, entitled Home is Where the Heart Is. Well, for us as Christians, home is where Jesus is. It's where God is. It's where the Holy Spirit is. It's where the redeemed of all the ages is. It's the home that Jesus has gone to prepare for us. 
that we can come home and be with him forever and ever and ever. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, he said, you may be also. It just don't get any better than that, folks. It just doesn't get any better than that. And so no matter what we're called upon to endure for the cause of Christ here in this life, it really is so very inconsequential. I, I, I sometimes feel ashamed of myself uh, because sometimes when I'm not feeling all that good, maybe get an upset stomach or something, and I, and I have to be careful that I don't start having some sort of a pity party. You know, well, that's nothing. That is nothing. Look at what we're about to get. Look what Jesus has gone to do for us, to prepare a place for us. And it will be our eternal home. We're told in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we always be with the Lord. Why? Because he's gone to prepare a place for us that where he is, we may be also. Therefore, he says, comfort one another with these words. I believe that that's exactly what Jesus was doing in the upper room that night. After telling his apostles, I'm going to be betrayed into the hands of the Jews. Within the next day, I'm going to be put to death on a Roman's cross. And not only that, but I'm going to leave you. I'm going to be raised from the dead. That had to be good news. But then he said, but then I'm going to go back to the Father where I came from. And that wasn't good news at that time to them. They really didn't understand all of that. And Jesus saw that in their faces, I'm sure. And that's the reason why he said the things that we read about here in John chapter 14. When, when you think about the return of Christ, what do you think about? I, I know that we have limited information about that event as far as exactly what's going to happen and how's it going to happen and all that sort of thing. I don't think that there's anything wrong with us using these minds with these wonderful imaginations that God has given us to use. I don't think there's anything wrong with us using that imagination to try and get some kind of an idea about that time when Jesus comes with the trump of the archangels and we come forth, whether we're in the grave or whether we're still alive, but we come forth, we're changed. We're changed into a glorified body. And we ascend into the heavens to meet Jesus Christ in the heavens. And then we're taken to the presence of God. And we stand before Jesus Christ in judgment. And those who are his will hear those most precious of all words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joys of thy Lord. Just another way of saying, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you can come also, you may be also. But you know what I really like to, to think about and visualize? I have no idea what it's going to be like. This is just what I have gotten in my mind, what it's going to be like. We're now in eternity, right? There is no such thing as time. There is no, no awareness of minutes, hours, days, years, millenniums, or anything like that. So it really doesn't, take, it doesn't make any difference what the schedule is as far as how things go. I've just got it in my mind that as one that belongs to Jesus, he personally will escort us into the presence of the Father and that he will say to the Father, Father, here is your child and call us by name. And there we are delivered to the Father, the kingdom delivered according to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 28. And I just like to see it as an individual thing because Christ, by the way, as we all know, is a very personal Savior. He's either our Savior or He's not. He's a very personal Savior. And I believe that He, I just like to think of it, that He will personally introduce me to the Father 
as one of his children, bought by the blood, saved by the grace. And that could be your hope and dream this evening if you need to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you're here and you're not a Christian and you need to become a Christian, we offer you the opportunity to come in faith in repentance of your sins, confess Jesus Christ to be the Son of God, be buried with him in the waters of baptism, to arise a new creature in Christ, to live in hope of that glorious time where we get to go home to the mansion that Jesus has prepared for us. If you need to respond this evening to become a Christian or if you need the prayers of the saints and the encouragement of your brothers and sisters in Christ to help you be more faithful and more committed to your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, would you not let us know while we stand and sing?